Hello, my name is Lee Breeze. I'm an independent crop consultant in Central North Dakota, and I work directly with farmers to help them manage their cropping needs. We scout their fields for pests, diseases, and insects, and we also help them with their fertility plans, precision egg, and making several decisions on the farm. This includes managing your soil. And I want to talk to you today about soil health and how the details matter. First of all, I want you to understand or that my perception of soil health is that it is a foundation of how we farm and what is going on. And there are several definitions of soil health available. Most of them talk about biological, physical, and chemical properties. And while I don't disagree with them, I don't know that they're very actionable. However, this is my definition of managing for soil health. It is simply managing to protect and improve the soil. So small gains are worth it and they're always worthwhile in my book. And I don't think that there's any end goal or finishing point. So with this, it's for every farm. I truly believe this. I work on several different types of farms with different practices across the board and we can help manage your soil in a better way in every one of those. So even if you're not on the train of soil health or all of those buzzwords, understand that what we can do to help you manage and protect your soil is valuable for every farm. So thankfully, in our current situation, we really don't see these types of things. This is a picture from the Texas in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl. And these pictures are really just scary, right? They're, they're an issue. They're, they're something to be very concerned about and we hope we never see this again. Oh, wait a minute, that picture is in color. And that picture is a picture that I took. And it just so happened to be on Earth Day in 2015. So yes, we do still see these types of events. We still see significant erosion. We still see significant washing. We still see significant losses in the soil to this day. And it is actually, unfortunately, way too common. So what I wanna start you off with is the idea of assessing your operation. And I don't just mean looking at the books and looking at the prices and what may return on your crops. You need to do all of that. And I know that you're already doing that. What I want you to do is to think about assessing your operation with a new set of eyes, starting afresh and starting anew and seeing it as, if, as you have never seen it before and looking at it from that perspective because I want you to notice things that may have been slowly happening over time that are just creeping in and you don't see them as a cumulative effect. Folks, this is a field here that one of the farmers I've worked with has been using. This farmer uses minimum till, no till. They're not doing any major soil disturbance to this field, but there's already significant losses here. We're not doing enough to actually build this field is where the possibility comes in. You can see the native prairie on the left and you can see the condition of the field on the right and that is no longer topsoil. This again is a no-till farmer. And this is a, after, a photograph after a five inch rainfall. Now, how do you manage for five inch rainfall? How do you predict these things? Well, in this case, this pathway here is a major water pathway in this field. There are opportunities for us to change the management a little bit in some of these areas and other areas to help prevent this gushing of water through this pathway. And this is a common appearance of the snow in North Dakota. Um, we don't have a lot of snow this year, but it still does have this grayish, mottlish, brownish color to it. Folks, this is soil that is moving. And today it is negative 20 degrees outside and the soil is frozen, but I do want you to understand that even though it's frozen soil, it still blows, it still moves, and all sizes of particles of soil will move. This is common, and unfortunately so. Here's another washout in this one. Here you can see they're starting to fill it in. This is a perennial thing. This is an ephemeral gully that comes every year, and it is a known place where this water is flowing and going to. We don't have control of the water upstream per, per se, but we do have control over some of the management that happens in this field. And this gully is big enough, you could park a full-size pickup in it and hardly see it. Now this is not snow, and this is a condition that is common in North Dakota. In higher rainfall areas, it is much less common, but we're in a semi-arid climate. And these are actually salt accumulations on the surface of the soil. And these salts are not necessarily in themselves particularly bad. These salts are calcium, magnesium, sulfate, chloride, a little bit of sodium. So those are plant nutrients, right? 
the problem happens is when we combine them or concentrate them at the surface of the soil. And that's really what's happening here. We get less rainfall than we do evaporation. This picture was taken in April when we've had high winds. After the snow melt, there was a lot of moisture. And those, those nutrients that were dissolved in the soil have come to the surface with the water. The water evaporates and leaves the crust behind. It's very much like leaving a pot of water boiling on the stove and you get a salt crust. This is continuously happening over time and the plants simply do not grow in these areas. These areas can become huge. This is a picture of a quarter section. Um, this is a uh, drone photo of this. This is unfortunately not a field that I help manage because I think we could help make a difference here. Everywhere that there is white or off color, the crop has died. Everywhere that you're seeing the dark green, the crop's doing well. And even in these lighter areas, these lighter colored yellowish green areas, the crop is suffering dramatically. This is close to, if not more than half of this field. And these field, these acres were planted, they were fertilized, they were sprayed. All of the inputs are there and none of the return is there. And we can do better. So by now, I hope you're wondering, how does this happen? How do you let your fields get so terrible in North Dakota? What is going on? Well, I want to show you a picture of recently, fairly current picture of me versus a picture not all that long ago. And folks, here's really what is happening. This is the point of this, is that these things are happening slowly over time and they're hard to see. And you can tell in this picture that I've lost a little bit on the top and I've gained a significant amount in the middle section, okay? So this is what happens. It happens slowly to people all the time. It happens slowly to our fields all the time. And some of these changes in these fields have been going on for generations, not just a decade or so. So please understand that this is happening. This is my point with coming back with new eyes. I want you to look at your fields as if you don't know that that spot's always been a troublesome spot or it's always been a problem. Take somebody with you, take your, your in-laws with you, take your relatives with you, take your friends from the city with you and have them ask you questions. Why is that different? Why is this different? And really think about why that is and what you may be able to do different that you haven't done in the past. In this situation, I've made a New Year's resolution to start losing some weight. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, that's the goal setting, right? So once you've seen the issues, once you've seen my weight gain, and I've now set a goal of losing some weight, that is how we can move forward. Now, I want you to think about this if in your farm. You've gone out and saw your fields with a new eye, with a new eye, with attention to detail, not just assuming that those things are the way they are and there's nothing you can do about them. In some cases, that is true, but I want you to reassess them anyway and set goals. What do you want your farm to look like? What is, what is the goal? Where is the ending? Where do you want it to be? What should things look like when you get done? Hopefully, you want to be more like the picture on the right and less like the picture on the left. This is a field of a farmer of mine who is starting to try minimum till or no till. These fields are actually kitty corner across an intersection. So the field on that on the left here is his conventional tillage, what he's been doing for, for a long period of time in order to manage excess moisture. And the field on the right here is the one that he's no-tilled for about three years. And these are literally 50 feet apart. So that is the goal here is to try some new things and see if you can make a difference, if you can make it work. Because not every practice works in every situation. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you exactly how to farm where you are. These practices have to be learned and worked into the system. Now, understanding what you want to see on your farm. Again, do you wanna see the picture on the left or would you rather see the picture on the right? And the point here is, what is your goal? Make sure you have a clearly defined goal where you want to be. It helps you dramatically get to where you're going. All right, now, the other thing is to have realistic goals. If you've ever heard of the SMART goal system, it talks about specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. Those are, that's what a SMART goal is, okay? So is this achievable for me? Yes, that's a picture of me at 17 years old. This over here is a picture of me at 47 years old. I don't know that I'm gonna go back in time 30 years and be able to play basketball again, okay? So that's not the point of my weight loss journey in this. The understanding is the same for your fields. Some things have changed dramatically or significantly, and some of these things are never going to go back to the way they were at one time. However, that doesn't mean that your progress is not worthwhile. All right, so here's the specifics of this. 
I'm going to talk to you about the details. And that's really my goal here is to get you to think about the details and your details and how they matter to you on your farm. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about yo-yos. And I know that sounds odd, but the idea here is a yo-yo. You can easily go get yourself a yo-yo from your local box store, several places online, five to six dollars, and you'll get yourself actually a really nice yo-yo with bearings that will spin and you can do several tricks with it. Okay. And I tend to do this. And I have these out at my speaking engagements. Unfortunately, I'm not there today to hand some out to you in the audience. However, the idea behind the yo-yo is simple. Everybody can do it. Literally, everybody can do it. I've been at meetings where we handed out yo-yos. We had 300 participants in the room and everybody was able to do some tricks with the yo-yo within a few minutes. Now, this is the point with the soil health. You can manage your soil health. You can improve your soil. You can improve your operation, but you have to put the time into it. So we can go ahead and hand out yo-yos. We can talk about that. You can purchase one. You could read every article ever written about yo-yos. You could watch the hundreds of YouTube videos that are out there of several young children, 9, 10, 11 years old, showing you how to do tricks. And you can do this, but you won't learn how to yo-yo by watching the videos, by, watch, by reading the articles, unless you actually get a yo-yo and practice it, okay? That's the point here. The idea here is that you have to do it yourself and your details matter. I'm left-handed. And if I tried to instruct you on how to use yo-yo, that would might be challenging for about 70% of the population. Okay. So understanding that you have to fit it to your details. This is the rest of the point. So this one size fits all or the, the three rules to this, the seven steps or the five secrets. And you hear this all the time, and we, we like this as consumers, just do these few things and everything will work. Well, that's an unfortunately not the truth, right? You know, and it really gets into, it's just marketing gimmick in so many different ways. I'll buy my book and I'll tell you all. I don't have a book, folks. This is not why I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you to try to get you to avoid buying those books and trying to just read it and figuring that you're just going to get it working on your farm in, in seven easy steps or three simple ways. The point comes down to it has to be specific. If you will go with me back to my weight loss journey a little bit again, and I want to lose weight, well, that's a healthy goal, right? And I hope everybody's nodding their head and agreeing along. That's a good goal. Okay, well, how am I going to get there? That is important. What are the things that I'm going to do? If I decide that I'm going to exercise as part of my weight loss goal, that's a good thing. Now you're talking about it, but it's still not specific. and It's still not measurable. So we have to get to the specifics of this. How am I going to lose weight? How am I going to exercise? If I'm going to exercise, am I going to go for walks? Am I going to get a gym membership? Am I going to bicycle, run, or swim? Those are important things. The other thing is that when, what part of the day am I going to do this? Am I going to try to do it in the morning, the afternoon, the evening? When are we going to try to do this? Now, here's the crux of this. I don't swim well. I'm not near a pool, and I'm not a morning person. So if I said, I'm going to join a morning swim team to try to lose weight, that's probably not going to work, right? However, for my wife, she's just the exact opposite. And that is the perfect plan for her. Now, having a partner with your weight loss journey is a good thing, but I'm not going to be the guy going with her swimming, okay? So this is the point of these details matter. The specifics have to fit. Don't make it too easy to quit. Don't make it too easy to get out of it. Make it to something that works with you, something that works with your current existing equipment, that works with your current existing crop rotation, that works with your current existing herbicide programs. These are part of the ideas of getting it to fit. That's the whole point of this. Details matter. You have to customize your solutions. They should be customized to you as a farmer, to the individual field, and even down to the acre what needs to happen and what needs to work because the problems are different in different places and they're going to require different solutions but those solutions have to be ones that you can manage and achieve so here we have another nice aerial drone shot and the point of this is a great grower of mine that's long-term no-till this is a beautiful shot near the river he has some very nice fields here but we have a little bit of an issue and one of the first things that people don't understand about starting to reduce their tillage in order to manage their soil in a better way is that it starts with the combine. This is the first place that this starts. 
look at these pictures and you will see that there are stripes of residue out here. High residue, low residue, high residue, low residue, high residue, low residue. The thing is that these stripes are not going to match up with your planting equipment ever. And the issue with this is that you're now trying to seed into high residue and low residue in the same pass with the same singular settings on your drill or planter. That becomes a challenge. So my, my suggestion to you is to do your very best to spread these residue out to where it came from to get this variability down as low as possible because it makes your journey next spring that much more effective and that much more workable solution. Often I see people blaming the planting equipment when the real culprit has actually been the harvesting equipment or the harvest preparation. Now, in a situation like this, um, sometimes the wind gets part of this issue and you can see it here where some of these tails come out. It's the wind was causing us problem with this. Um, however, with, with this, where there's some things that we can do to lightly manage this without being aggressive tillage and still manage to help move that residue or, or make it more even and acceptable for the quality of the ground. So once you've set your goals and you've understood where you're going, you've decided on a path and tools and techniques and practices that'll work for you. You may be reducing tillage, you may be adding cover crops, you may be adding a different cash crop, you may be managing those gullies and washouts with a different thing. And that is part of your tool set. So now to build the system to make things work. I do like cover crops because they are the Swiss army knife of tools. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna tell you that cover crops are not one tool, they are several. They are 10, 20, 30, 40 different tools and it gets to be a little bit obnoxious and this becomes an issue, right? However, the cool thing about it is that they are individual plants. And so this is the thing is understanding the, the advantages and disadvantages of each of these individual plants of cover crop and then use those in your system to where they work. And here we really have a tale of two different types of field. On the left, we have a light sandy field. It tends to be very dry in the spring. It tends to be highly susceptible to wind erosion and we run out of moisture for sure in the end of the year. So that's very common for us. So this grower has changed his system to be very different. And you'll see here, this is after wheat harvest and this was a strip head where it pulls the heads off of the, the wheat instead of running all the straw through the combine. That is one way to manage that strippiness of the residue is to not move it through the combine at all, leave it attached to the soil. So that's one of the advantages he's done here. And he has enough small grain to make that stripper header justifiable on the farm, okay? There are other gains and drawbacks from that situation, but that is one thing that's worked for him. Then he comes into this and he seeds into his cover crops in the fall. Now we're not seeding the same kind of cover crop on every field. And we don't necessarily use huge differences in, in species to manage this. We know that this is gonna be a field that's gonna be dry in the spring or could easily be dry in the spring. So instead of using a frost hardy cover crop like a winter cereal rye, we've gone in here, the grass crop in this is oats. And oats, while it is fairly strong at cold temperatures, will freeze frost kill every year for us. The goal here is to actually get this oats to grow up get a nice mat about eight to 10 inches tall and then freeze out because we want it to actually lay down. And we want this to happen before it starts to head out or, or get really lignified. So that this acts more like lawn clippings next spring than more additional straw like we have over here in the weed stubble. And the other thing that he's used in here has been some flax. Now that flax is meant to stand stiff tall in the winter as well. So while these wheat residue will stand for the winter to try to help us catch some snow, the flax residue will definitely stand fairly tall in the winter. So two ideas here to manage and catch snow, the, the wheat straw and the flax straw. And then the third one is the oats. And that is to prevent, lay that mat down, that mulch down for next spring and hopefully reduce wind evaporation from this field to save spring moisture. So that's a specific plan for a specific field. Now, same producer here we have on the right, and this is one a different field a couple miles away. Very low, very high clay soil, tends to be very wet often, and this is entirely different management. You'll see that we're using some different cover crops in here. He has some oats in here for frost kill. He's also put some winter cereal rye in here. So instead of having 100% of the grass crop being a frost kill or a non-frost kill, we've mixed it, and it's about 50-50 in this situation. So half of that is gonna die out and 
be gone over the winter, and half of it is going to come back and use some moisture in the spring. You'll also see there that he's holding a radish in his hand. This radish is about 29 days old. And we did not dig this one up all the way, but we did dig some others up and they're almost 29 inches deep with the roots. It's a very fine taproot at the end, but almost an inch a day for this radish's life and how deep it has grown. And this is helping it to tap down and get into several different types of moisture deeper in the profile. The carryover winter rye is also gonna be there to help us use extra spring moisture. Um, we can stop that at any time. We can go in and terminate that cereal rye with a herbicide and move on from there. So this is a different type of cover crop mix than the other one. It's the same farmer. It's planted in almost the same time frame, but it's a different cover crop mix because those details matter. The specifics of what we're trying to do is important and that's going to make it successful or not successful. Now here we have planted into some cereal rye and drilled right into it, extending cereal rye. Now in this situation, it was intended to be a, a spring cover from the get-go. So this was not planted at a high rate. This was planted at a fairly low rate. And again, those rates are gonna depend on where you're at, what your goals are. Our goal in this system was primarily to move some spring moisture and to get some mulch cover for weed protection. And as you can see, we do have some mulch cover. We do not have 100% cover. There's several bare pieces of ground in here. So this is simply an augmentation for our weed control. But if we use too much CRI to try to get that weed control, we run the risk here of running short on moisture. So this is where you have to fine tune it. This again is what time of day am I gonna exercise? Okay, what rates are going to fit into your farm for your specific goals? And unfortunately, those things change over time, right? Not every year is the same, but you can find a nice rate that will work in your area. In our area, we're running about a bushel or somewhere between 40 to 60 pounds an acre of grass cover crops. We're changing those mixtures of a winter kill or frost kill to fit specific needs. In other areas that I've been to, they need to be at much higher rates because they have much more moisture and they need to move that water faster somewhere in that 90, 90, even 100 pounds of a winter hardy cover crop. Those things matter, those details matter. I don't know what they are for your farm. I can tell you that one of the best ways to test that out is when you decide to use a cover crop to plant it at different rates and different strips along the way. It's not very hard to change your rate on the go, on the fly, in a field, and see those things side by side by side. That's probably the best place to do it, okay? So now, again, the residue is another part of this. This is helping us manage those soils, helping us reduce erosion, prevent losses of erosion. In this situation, this is simply soybean planted directly into corn, no-till with no cover crop. You're seeing here primarily corn residue that's still from the year before, and it is this mid-season. So that is helping us for a long period of time. It is helping reduce rain splashes, helping reduce washing, and it's helping reduce wind erosion. On the right, again, is a much wetter field where we use the cereal rye to help manage the water. So instead of tillage and evaporation, we use the green growing cereal rye to help manage the water. This was sprayed out fairly late because it was a very wet year. And again, this is mid season. We're about to hit row close and 30 inch rows here, not very far from this. And this cereal rye residue is still here. And it is also helping with weed control impulses. And that is a nice little benefit. The other thing that I wanted to mention briefly and talk about, and in, in this happens in North Dakota all the time, we're fairly flat, we're fairly consistent, and people like square fields because they're very logistically friendly, right? The less headlands you have, the better. The less turning you do, the better. And I understand that. This is critically important. However, there are times when you need to have a different idea for a different acre. This is what we're getting at with this photograph here. On the far left, I have the grower has planted soybean there. In the middle strip here with this light gray color is corn. On the very bottom left corner, you'll see here there's some residue and some stripes going through that. That was planted to cereal rye and left to cereal rye. Then on the far left here, we have the dark green, again, is soybean. And these blonde colorations, these light colored spots in here, those are barley. These are barley planted into just these areas. And you can see that the farmer has squared these areas off to make them more logistically useful as best he can. And he could have squared, squared them off even more, but he was trying to get as many of those acres for soybean as he could. These are saline acres in this field and high moisture acres. 
Did he get them all? No. You can easily see there are wet spots and drowned outs in both of these fields here, the corn and the soybean. We didn't get every acre, but we did get a predominant majority of these acres. Where this barley is planted, corn or soybean do very, very poorly if they do well, if they grow at all. So very, very low yield. The, the other idea with the barley is that we're not putting a whole lot of energy or effort into the barley. Okay. I did mention that most of the salts are actually nutrients, plant nutrients. That is true of many of the other nutrients in these salt spots. When we do soil tests, we have more than enough plant nutrients in these areas for maximum yield. The challenge here is excess moisture and excess salts. So we didn't add nu nutrients to the barley. We simply planted the barley. We also didn't plant the barley on time because these areas tend to be too wet early in the spring. We planted the barley as soon as he could get in with reasonable expectations. And so this barley was about 50% of our normal yield in this area. You'd say, wow, that's a disaster. Well, the corn and the soybean usually yield anywhere from five to 10% of the rest of the field. So actually we're gaining quite a bit. And the expense of putting in the barley is a lot less than the expense of the corn or the soybean. This is my story of the hired man that comes on Friday for the paycheck. If you never see him the rest of the week, it doesn't take very long before that person gets fired. I hope not anyway. So this is these acres needed to be fired from corn and soybean production, okay? And the idea behind the hired man is yes, you wanna fire him, but you may guess what, he's your nephew, so you can't exactly fire him. Now, that doesn't mean you put him in the most expensive piece of equipment to do the most important job, right? And this is where we're at with the corn and soybean. The corn and soybean are the money makers on this farm, but that doesn't mean that they're the money maker in every acre. In this case, we've given barley the broom, like you would give your nephew the broom. Go and do the task that nobody else wants to do and give us a little bit back and help us make this a little bit more economical. And surprisingly, this makes these fields much more economical. Instead of negative the cost of input in those acres, we're getting a small return on that investment. And this is helping to manage that salt and that water and giving us a window for cover crops. You can see the barley has already been harvested. We're still in early in the season in the fall, we have opportunity and time to plant cover crops in these. There are several ways to do cover crops, but I definitely prefer that you plant them. I think that is a must. If you're going to broadcast them out there, have realistic expectations, that's only gonna work about 30 to 50% of the time, depending on your rainfall situation. People don't broadcast their cash crops and for good reason. Now, in this situation, the grower did this and separated by seed size, it was through a disc drill. One tank on the disc drill had the larger seed, the other tank had the smaller seed. Everything was drilled at the same depth. It's not perfect, but it works a lot better than broadcast. If you're gonna use livestock in your operation, that is a wonderful benefit to this. Just again, keep in mind that you have to make sure the details fit. Make sure that you're getting the right rates. Don't be putting the fertilizer in the bad spots that you're gonna fire anyway. Try to move that fertilizer through your farm because it's very, very important to cross them. Another way to have cattle is simply to have grazing. And that is one of those things that again, needs an entirely separate situation of management. Here we're at a grazing school in South Dakota where we're measuring the height of the residue of the cover crops. We're estimating the size of the animals and we're estimating how large we wanna make that pen in order to get the best utility out of that. So again, this is another trick you're gonna to have to learn if you wanna add it. Then you finally, I need you to evaluate your progress. And by that, I mean using a shovel. What we're really looking at here is the aggregates, these little Lego blocks. These are the things that are gonna make a difference. On the left, I have a sandy soil with aggregates. In the middle, I have a medium textured soil. And on the right, I have a clay soil. You can see that clay soil still has aggregates and it's actually wet. My hand is moist but you don't see the sloppy running pudding-like consistency. That's what we're after. We want the soil particles to be held together in groups. Roots are your power that are doing this for you. So the more root growth, the more days of root growth, the more likely you are to build aggregates. That's really the story behind that. And how you're doing this, again, we have the broadcast cover crop on the left. After harvest, it came on well, but this is a winter hardy cover crop. Had we used a frost kill cover crop, it would already be dead. So the details matter. Understand your system and understand where you need different tools and what tools you need in different situations. Finally, I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the surprises that we've seen in many different systems. And it doesn't mean that you have to reach for the jug or the bag of seed every time. 
Here we have on this left, we had significant infestation of aphids late in the season on spring wheat, and they were causing significant problems. We were very concerned about them. We contacted the entomologists who told us we're well past the time when aphids are going to be economically important. And the, the adv advice was not to spray for these pests. So we didn't. And within a couple of weeks here, you can see the color has changed in this picture on the right. And there's a little black and orange bug in there. That is actually a ladybug varmint. And they are basically aphid comrades. They come through munching on these aphids. The cool part of this is that even though they came in here and those aphids didn't matter to the wheat, what happened is that we built up populations of ladybugs. We also have soybean aphid that is a problem here in North Dakota. And what happened is the soybean fields next to all the wheat fields that were not sprayed for aphids were not sprayed for soybean aphid either. The ladybugs dispersed from the wheat field went out and managed those pests for us. This is about paying attention to the little things that are happening, what's going on and how they affect the surrounding area. Thank you for your time, folks. I hope that you remember the details matter. And just in case you wanted a sticker, you're welcome to email me here and send me your address and I will mail one to you. Thank you again. All right, thanks, Lee. Um, we have a couple questions. So there's one here in the chat box, and I think at some point in your presentation, you had a field of soybeans. Um, so I guess in that picture, were the soybeans drilled in without a trash cleaning attachment? I don't know. Yeah, the, we didn't uh, move the, the trash off the row. We just reset the, the equipment to drill into it. Uh, even with the planter system, we're not doing a whole lot of moving that residue off the row because it's, it's giving us control of weeds later on. In some systems we are, but we tend not to do a whole lot of movement of that trash. Just, just as long as we get good uh, plant depth and accurate planting depth, then we leave it be. All right. Um, another question is what equipment adjustments or additions have you experienced with your customers, drills or planters to best manage cover crop and reduce tillage systems? Were they just basic adjustments or were they, they innovative? Uh, for the most part, not a lot of really wild innovation or uh, home building kind of stuff going on. The first thing is uh, a lot of this stuff we've been um, adding weight to the planter because it's taking a little more down pressure to get through the residue and into the soil. Once those uh, aggregates start to build up, the soil is becoming firmer. I wouldn't say it's hard or compacted in these areas. We've, we measure that and we pay attention to that, but um, it is firmer. So you need a little more, a little more down pressure on that. And so that's been the main thing that we've done. The other thing is just moderating speed for the condition. That's critically important. Okay. Um, is there any particular cover crop or cover crop mix that has resulted in crop stand damage from insects? And how do you handle it? Um, yeah, how do you handle it? Yeah, um, we haven't had that issue yet. We pay close attention to it. I did have some slug damage one year under cereal rye in a few areas, but slugs are not very common here. We are fairly arid or semi-arid in North Dakota, so we don't stay that moist and that wet early on in spring. We have high winds to 20, 30, 40 mile hour winds for two to three weeks, so it tends to dry things out. We do see that uh, cutworm larvae like the cover crops a little bit more. They do like the residue a little bit more, uh, but I wouldn't say it's been a significant problem and we're just scouting early and paying attention to it. And when we need to, we are treating for them. Okay. Is there any, um, how do you measure soil health? I guess we kind of touched health? on that there, um, but I guess organic matter. Uh, yeah, I'm not real comfortable with any of those measurements, honestly. Lab measurements are very sporadic. And the, the variability of soil health is incredible. We talk about variability of plant nutrients in the soil, but those actually move with the water. And so there's much more uniformity with the plant nutrients and there is soil health. So you're talking about um, so sampling to a degree that isn't even feasible. I, I did mention the shovel. That's my favorite way to manage that, to pay attention to that. You're looking for aggregates. Aggregates are kind of the, the support system that the cities, if you will, uh, where the biology connects. They're showing about your root growth. Um, so the shovel is the main tool, looking at root growth, seeing how the roots are growing. Are they moving in the right directions? Are they 
moving out? Are they helping build aggregates? That's been the most um, reliable way to see that you're building it. It does take some time, but even with that, aggregates can start to form in within a year or two and you'll start seeing differences right away. Um, that's been the main one. I, I'm not necessarily against the laboratory tests, but they're really hard to, to compare with um, before and after helps, but we have to understand that biology cycles on the time scale of days, weeks, and even hours in some of it. So you get very different things. So even if you took a soil test for chemical nutrients, different times of the season, you're going to see different levels. And actually the biology cycle is so much faster that it's really hard to catch it at the same time. So uh, not necessarily against it, but I don't put a lot of management decisions based on the, the biology measurements. The shovel is the main one. That's showing us the traffic ability. That's giving us the tilth. That's giving us what we're planting into. Um, it's helping us manage the water. So aggregates are the one that I really put more stock in. All right. Um, one more. If you have to treat for slugs, what are you treating with? I don't know that there is a treatment for slugs. Um, I'm not sure that there is. Uh, so we didn't, we did not treat for them. We simply ended up with some damage in some areas. Um, so I, I don't deal with them often enough, but I, they are a mollusk. So insecticides do not work. Um, I think there are a few potential things that work, but I don't think they work on agricultural scales. All right. I think that is all the time we have for questions right now. If there's any more questions, we'll send them to you. Um, I guess I do have one question that a couple people have asked. How long did it take to grow your beard? <laughs> uh, so it's been a continuous process. Like I tell people, I have a salt spot on top. So I decided to fire those acres and put a cover crop down here. Um, I've had the beard now for eight years. Um, and to get to the length, it's a terminal length. It took about three years to get to my terminal length. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll pass any questions on. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for the opportunity, folks. And don't forget to send me an email. I will definitely send those stickers to you. All right. Thank you.